Good morning. I'd like to thank each and every one of you for viewing this video today. I'm sorry I'm a little late getting it up, but I've been just a little bit under the weather. And I know I had to get it up anyway, so I'm going to give it a shot. Uh, I was looking at Facebook, and I was actually in bed uh, with my uh, phone checking, looking, looking at some things on Facebook a few days ago while I was really sick. And uh, I saw this little picture there that people are constantly putting up pictures about this or that. And I'm very, very careful on what I choose to share or not share because a lot of those things seem like they're uh, of a Christian nature or biblical, but that nothing could be farther from the truth. And you have to have a great understanding of what's being said and how it's being said to, to understand that. But this one was quite simple. It said, um, religion sets rules. And then under that it said, Jesus sets you free. And I, I smiled and I thought, well, now that one really is, that is biblical. And, and, and that was true. And, and so I did share that. And along those same lines, I'm, I'm checking emails that I get off of this website. And I received an email from a 17-year-old young lady that said, Pastor Rick, I got a question. I said, I never saw the inside of a church until I was 15 years old. And, and during the time when I was 15, I got saved. And I've been trying to get my mom and dad uh, to go to church to get saved because they're big party people and that's all that's all they ever do and and I'm worried about them so when I bring it up to my mother she says what's the need she said there's a couple in your church that you go to that your dad and I go out with every weekend and, and, and party and well she wanted to know what to do and uh, I gave her a a personal response concerning willful sin and, and some courses of action she should try to do and what she should try to do. But I thought, okay, there was this little thing on Facebook and I'm reading this particular email. I thought, well, maybe the good Lord wants me to speak on Christian liberty. And seeing how this is uh, the time when our, when our uh, forefathers were coming together, well, actually, it was... Uh, March 23rd, 1775, about 240 years ago, see this group of men met at uh, St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia, and they were going to figure out a way to avoid war. And you know, most of them were willing to do anything, anything at all, for, for peace, and that's understandable. But some of them even wanted to compromise with tyranny. And about that time, a young, cocky 39-year-old man stood up and said these words. Now, some of you might remember the last line, or, or some of you history buffs might remember all of it. And I had to memorize it myself. But um, he said, there is a just God who presides over the destinies of nations. The battle, sir, is not to the strong alone. It is to the vigilant, the active, the brave. Is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased? At the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know no what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. That man, as most of you know, was Patrick Henry. See, and his words have ignited a desire for freedom in the hearts of, of, of millions from all over the world. And every year, on the 4th of July, we celebrate Independence Day. So it's a good idea to remind ourselves of how precious our freedom truly is and how many sacrificed through all the wars we've had to guarantee this freedom. But see, there's more to being free than just being an American. The Bill of Rights guarantees important freedoms, which we seem to be now losing daily or they're modified to suit our government's needs and our government's mindsets. Now, these articles can't free us from one thing, and that is our slavery to sin. See, Congress, as much as they try to pass laws on this or that, cannot pass or modify a law that frees us from greed, from lust, and pride. The president, even great and powerful ones from the past, 
have never found a way to outlaw death. Everybody wants to be free, even those of us who live in the good old USA. See, we have and are capable of a much greater and deeper freedom. You see, the Bible contains a declaration of independence also. And in case some of you didn't know that, it's the book of Galatians. Okay? Today, I would like for us to dwell into this just a little bit deeper. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. And I'm going to take the time to read all this to you. Excuse me while I change glasses. Uh, these, I've never worn glasses in my life, and now I have to wear them, but they're not quite right, so I have to go back to the cheater glasses to read while uh, they're working on getting the glasses right. But here again, that's Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 through 15. If you don't have your Bibles, just listen up. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be in tangled again with the yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. You ran well, who hindered you from obeying the truth. This perse persecution does not come from him who calls you. A little leaven leaves the whole lump. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will have no other mind, but he who troubles you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware, lest you be consumed by one another. May God bless the reading of his holy word. All right, in the words of Paul, God invites you and I to experience a freedom which no Congress, no President, Supreme Court, nobody could ever give or modify or take away. Now Paul tells us three things we must realize if we want to live in liberty. Number one. Freedom comes from Christ, and we see that in verses 1 through 6. See, Paul clearly declares the source of our freedom when he writes about the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Christ bought our freedom by his death on the cross. See, it's freedom from the guilt and penalty of sin, a freedom to enjoy peace with God, a freedom to love. To love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves, a freedom to live life abundantly and full of joy, a freedom from death, and most importantly, for eternal life. That's why John in 834 says, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. But see, in the book of Galatians, Paul stresses the Christian's freedom from having to try to earn God's grace by our, by our works you see, in the early church, there, there were some Jews, there was quite a few Jews who believed that, that Christ really was the Messiah. But they also thought that in order to be a child of God, you were, you were responsible for keeping the laws of Moses. Now, even some religions and denominations thrive just on that today. Another example, that's, that's just simply another example, religion has rules. See, God's grace is just not sufficient for them, I guess, because we don't have those rules. See, in other words, faith in Christ just isn't enough to make you right with God. That's what they feel. Now, true enough, we know we have to believe in Jesus. But in addition, you have to do these other things. Basically, they were saying you had to become a Jew and follow all these rules before you became a true disciple of Christ. But Paul, but Paul you know, he's shaking his head. He's like, whoa, 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 hold up, people. This will never do. Salvation's not about what 
we do. It's about what Christ has done on the cross for all of us. All we do is respond by faith to his grace. See, if you add anything else, you're putting people back into slavery. And when I say slavery, I'm talking about our slavery to sin. See, we're, we're stuck with this old sinful nature thanks to things that happened back in the Garden of Eden. See, but we, but we don't need to be a slave to sin. Jesus came to set us free. The principle behind Paul's words is that your relationship with God is based on his grace and your faith in Jesus Christ. Period. That's it. See, now what that means for us is God's love for us is not based on our performance. See, God doesn't love us more when you've been good, and he doesn't love us any less when we've been bad. Now, as I've said, he does discipline us. He disciplines Christians who are disobedient. And sometimes that can be severe. But you don't have to be a slave to fear. You don't have to worry that when he's through with you because you don't measure up. You don't have to worry that you might be kicked out of the will or now, oh gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm doomed to hell because of sin. And he's taking his free gift back. We don't have to worry about that. See, he treats us like any loving father does. He's pleased when we do good. He punishes us when we do wrong. But always, always loving us and willing to forgive us. You know, that's why the psalmist tells us that the Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in mercy. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us accordingly to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great it is mercy towards us who fear him. As far as the east from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. As a father pities his children, so does the Lord pity those who fear him. As I've said, when we become a child of God, he has immediately, forgotten our sins never to be mentioned again this that's what i'm talking about is freedom this is the freedom christ purchased on the cross freedom to enjoy a relationship of grace with our own heavenly father and not a relationship of rule keeping and fear it's the freedom of love knowing that he loves you and knowing you can love him that see that's a true and precious freedom that we can enjoy. But like anything else, unfortunately, some people don't enjoy this freedom, nor do they want you and I to enjoy it. So Paul also says, second thing, freedom must be defended. And that part is where we read in verses 7 through 12. See, Paul refuses to compromise with anybody who tries to water down God's grace. Instead, he jumps back with some harsh words. And he says, you were running well. You got off on the wrong track. You can be sure it wasn't the Lord who did this. See, those who oppose grace are way off base. They're not from the Lord. A little yeast leavens the whole loaf. Watch out for this kind of teaching. It can infiltrate your thinking quickly and lead you astray. That's what Paul wants to tell us. See, he wants to reject their heresy. And leave God to deal with them. Turn away from this false teaching and let God get them straight. See, even he has to cut them off. Not us. See, Paul leaves no room for compromise in all that he just said. See, he strongly opposes those who try to rob believers of their liberty. See, we've we, we got to be willing to defend our freedom in Christ also, see. And, and one, of, one of the jobs of a pastor, excuse me, is, is to educate people about false teachings. And you see a lot of that on these social media outlets, okay? And I know sometimes I come down hard on y'all on certain topics, but my goal and any minister's goal is to try to get you to understand what the Bible teaches instead of falling for doctrine that sounds good, but in reality leads you right back into that sin and slavery, the slippery sliding slope of Satan. See, you've got the same responsibility to your family, your friends, your brothers, especially your brothers and sisters in Christ. Any sign, anytime, anybody at all tries to weaken God's grace, they're cutting down what Jesus did on the cross. See, Jesus died 
to purchase your freedom, but you also got to hold on to this freedom and defend it. See, that's the way it works in our nation, basically. In our military, men and women, and I was in the military, and thank God I wasn't in any war when I was in, but they're, they're constantly training and working to, to deal with the threats of our freedom. George Orwell once said, people sleep peacefully in beds at night only because rough men stand ready to do violence on their behalf. Wow. See, freedom's got to be defended. And this is true in the physical world, and it's true in the spiritual realm that Jesus died for you to live in the freedoms of God's grace. Don't allow anybody else or anything else to rob you of this freedom. It cost Jesus his life. It's too precious. There's another truth that we have to understand about this freedom. Jesus died and I for you to joy. Now listen carefully. Freedom's not being able to do what you want, but willing to do what is right. And see, that's, that's what we find in verses 13 through 15. See, there's one great challenge to living in a free nation like ours. You hear people talking all the time, and they go on and on and on about, I got my rights, I got my rights. But you never hear anybody speaking of the responsibilities that come along with those rights. See, in the same way it's easy for us to focus on freedom of being a Christian, but not focusing on responsibilities. You know, the responsibilities come with any type of freedom. See, and that's why Paul stretches that liberty from the law is not a license to do as you want, but freedom to do what you ought. Instead of using our freedom selfishly, Paul calls us to love and serve one another. He says when you use your freedom as it was intended, you'll fulfill the law of God. And summed up everybody, you know, that means loving your neighbor as yourself. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're fulfilling one of God's great commandments. You understand what I'm saying? See, when you live in freedom that Christ gave us, you live in the liberty of obedience. You see, God's grace sets you free to become his obedient child. You enjoy not the freedom to sin, but the freedom to do what pleases God himself. You understand? See, freedom does not mean I'm able to do whatever I want to do. Freedom means I have been set free to become all that God wants me to be, to achieve all that God wants me to achieve, and to enjoy all that God wants me to enjoy. To live each life every day, like I say over and over, to the fullest, to have life and to live it abundantly. You see how great our Lord's ways are? Now I'd say people are going to say, that's not freedom, I have to do what he wants me to do. And they're missing the whole point. See, legalists say the only way to get people to do what God wants is to make them keep the rules. See, religion and denominationalism emphasizes this, and it's not biblical at all. When you and I enjoy this great freedom of God's grace, we find the most precious liberty anybody's ever known. See, we as saved, born-again children of God because of what he did at Calvary. And that should want us to live for him, to be obedient to him. Not because of law or that we're commanded to do so, because we are free to choose. We can just walk away and, and live a life however we want. But we should want to simply because Jesus gave his life, his own life for us. See, this is the freedom God wants you to have, to obey him from love, not fear, to do what pleases him, not because you must, but because you want to. See, this is the greatest freedom of all. Even that old cocky Patrick Henry realized the importance of this kind of freedom here, here in our own nation. See, after the American Revolution, he also made this statement. It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians on religion but on the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was our founding fathers. That's what we were founding on. A far cry from our leaders today, isn't it? Who go so far as to deny Christianity? What our country was founded on. Our country is on its way to losing its freedom 
my friends. But as a Christian, are you enjoying the freedom Christ has provided for you? Yeah, it's still a freedom to live in sin. That's true. But is it really what God wants us to do? Is it really exemplifying our Christian witness? Is it really something you want to be disciplined for? Enjoy your freedom, but enjoy it responsibly. God loves us. God wants us to have that abundant life. And yeah, Christian liberty, you hear a lot of people say it. And we do have it. But again, let's do it responsibly. If any of you are listening and are unsaved, you're in a whole different world of hurt. You're not able to enjoy these Christian liberties that we have. You're not wanting to put forth the effort to love God. But I tell you, once you accept Jesus into your heart, you'll do all that you want to do, all that you can do for Him. I promise you that. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Thank you for this day. Thank you for all your blessings. Thank you for giving us our liberty, God. Thank you for going to Calvary. Thank you for sending your son to Calvary to die on the cross for me, for everyone, for every individual. Thank you, dear Lord. Let us just try our best. Give us the power to do our best, to live that liberty responsible. For this I ask in the precious name of Jesus.